This is the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. This is a weekly podcast that will interview some of the top smallmouth bass anglers in North America. Travis and his guest will discuss what it takes to consistently catch big smallmouth, and you'll get a glimpse inside the mind of a trophy smallmouth angler. And now, here's your host of the Smallmouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. Welcome to the Smallmouth Crush Podcast. My name is Travis Manson. Are you guys ready? Another amazing week of talking smallmouth fishing, trophy smallmouth fishing, top anglers across the country. And man, it's just something about smallmouth. These guys know how to catch them. We're all addicted to the brown fish, and I really appreciate the viewers and listeners. Of course, we are on every podcast out there, as well as my YouTube channel, Smallmouth Crush. Tonight's guest, Jared Rohde, knows how to catch them. He's got a heck of a track record, and I'm really excited to talk to him about his experience when it comes to fishing for smallmouth. Before we get there, let's talk about the real shot. They have all the most wanted bass tackle that a smallmouth crush fan could want. Top brands like Mega Bass, Jackal, Evergreen, Z-Man, Daiwa, Shimano, Dirty Jigs, Kitek, St. Croix Rods, and much, much more. Standard baits like Berkeley, Rapala, VMC. You're going to find it all there. Real easy to shop online. Head on over to therealshot.com. Same day shipping. You're going to make sure we get that, that product out to you as quickly as possible and get it in your tackle box. Hey, if you use the code SMALLMOUTHCRUSH15, they're going to give you 15% off your first order. So, hey, that's a deal. Head on over to the Real Shot and let them know Smallmouth Crush sent you. I'm going to bring Jared on. And there he is. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Man, I'm doing good. I'm super excited to talk with you about smallmouth. I mean, it's a passion of mine. You've done very well chasing those fish over the years. Really excited to hear some of your stories, but I want to give the the listeners a little bit of background about yourself. So, Jared, if you could just take a moment to introduce yourself, let us know what part of the country uh, you're living in now and really some of the bodies of water that you fish on a regular basis. Okay. Uh, well, obviously, my name is Jared Rohde. Um I'm from Port Clinton, Ohio, uh, which is, if you're not familiar, that's on the, the southwestern uh, shore of Lake Erie. Um, so, you know, my home water being a, a huge smallmouth uh, fanatic, we could say, um, would certainly be the, the western end of Lake Erie, the Detroit River. Uh, so if you follow the tournament scene, uh, the tournaments w- would typically go out of Detroit River, uh, Lake St. Clair uh, in Sandusky, Ohio uh, utilize those ramps. Um, so I spent a lot of time, um, fishing both, uh, Ohio water, Canadian water, uh, as well as Michigan waters. Um, you know, in, in, in the Western basin of Lake Erie, some in the central basin of Lake Erie, uh, along the Southern shoreline there, uh, all of the Detroit river, uh, in, in Lake St. Clair. Um, but I'll also say I'm more of an, I'm more of an Erie guy because, I live five minutes from the boat ramp, so when I want to go fishing, uh, that's really close, so it's very easy for me. Um, so that's that's kind of where I cut my teeth smallmouth fishing. Um, I kind of started fishing when I was – my dad ran a charter business on Lake Erie, uh, and, and I've kind of taken that business over. Uh, I do a lot of guiding, mostly for walleye, but I also do guide for bass. I've kind of gotten into more of that lately. Um, but uh, I started fishing with him when I was five years old. Uh, Played a lot of sports growing up, and uh, you know I'm a real competitive person. So when you combine the tournament scene, you know, with smallmouth fishing here, that you know, and something that I felt I could be be pretty good at, um, you know, that that just was for me, and I I, I ate that up right away, um, and I put a lot of time in um, to to learn learn the water and, and you know learn what I think are, are the best ways to catch big smallmouth uh, in Lake Erie. As well as St. Clair, but more Erie. So your dad's charter uh, growing up, was was he mainly uh, chartering and guiding for walleye then? Yeah, typically. And, and, and he would do some bass fishing. And, and I would always, man, I would, I would love fishing. Gosh, I'd go with him all the time. And then it started out, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd watch fishing shows in the morning. You know, Jimmy Houston. I'm 39. So when I was little, it was, it was Jimmy Houston. It was Roland Martin. It was Bill Dance. And... And then Bassmaster on Saturday mornings and things like that. So 
I mean, when I was little, I mean, that was my dream. That was what I was going to do. So uh, I, I just, I developed a passion for fishing and fishing tournaments and bass. I mean, I would much rather bass fish than walleye fish any day of the week. Um, but we do live on an excellent walleye uh, lake. So uh, we do run a lot of trips for those. But I, I joined a bass club when I was 14 years old. I was uh, a freshman in high school. Erie Bay Bass was a local club and uh, started fishing as a non-boater. I didn't have a boat. And uh, my dad said, you know, go to college, get a good job, and, and, and then get a boat. Um, so I did that um, and uh, went to school. I teach seventh grade science and coach football and basketball as well. So I stay pretty busy. Uh, but that does give me the opportunity, obviously, to to have summers off um, in in uh, fish all summer. And then obviously on, on weekends and school, believe it or not, is pretty flexible um, if, if there's a tournament that I'd like to fish or things like that. So I'm very grateful for that. So, Jared, you know, having that that background and being able to fish as much as you did growing up, when did you start fishing tournaments? I would say I started fishing tournaments. Geez, I, I was uh, probably would be about 2003, 2004. I started, you know, I was fresh out of college, didn't have a lot of money. Um, but but uh, I started, you know, at the BFL level and I still love fishing the BFLs and and things like that. And I would fish I would fish anything that came to to Lake Erie. Um, if it's a team tournament, we, we don't have a ton of team trails anymore, but I, we, there were more back then, um, you know, and I befriended some of the guys that, that at the time I looked up to, um, and, and got the chance to fish with them a lot. But I guess to answer your question, I started, I've, I've been fishing tournaments probably close to maybe, you know, about 15 years, maybe close to 20 years, B bigger tournaments, um, or tournaments beyond you know, club or a, a little jackpot tournament, things like that. Do you get the chance to fish outside of the Lake Erie region? Have you explored some other great lakes as well? I have. I have. Uh, I, I've been up and fished uh, Lake Huron. Um, I've I've been uh, to a number of lakes uh, in, in Kentucky, Tennessee, places like that and fished. Um, I, I fished St. Clair, uh, St. Clair River quite a bit um, and in Lake St. Clair, but I've not fished any other uh, Great Lakes other than those. And I've been to the eastern end of Lake Erie, you know, Presque Isle down there, uh, New York way um, a couple times as well. So as far as the fishing on the, um, I guess, the western basin, that's what you're really familiar with. I I'm excited to really talk to you about that because there's, a, you know, it's such a big area and, and you have so many miles of water to cover. How do you approach that, you know, when you're when you're getting ready for, an event to come up and you have all these spots, you know, like how do you break that down? You must have hundreds of waypoints. Where do you start with I, all this I, experience and knowledge that you have? I put a waypoint in this fall we were fishing and it was 7,000 something. So it was ridiculous. One of the things that I do is, is I really, you know, you think about the time of year and the, the, the patterns um in, in the movements of the fish will kind of clue you in or clue me in to the areas uh where, where i want to start looking i love to fish deep um that that's kind of my bread and butter i would say in the vast majority of summer tournaments i don't typically make a cast in less than 20 feet of water sometimes but you know as summer wears on and the fish move deeper but i i, I try to cover a lot of water one of the things that, that I always tell people is I I have a number, you, you've heard of the spot on the spot or the sweet spots. You go to an area and if I'm practicing, I'll pull up on a spot where it's a pretty high percentage spot, meaning if there's fish in this area and I fish for 15, 20 minutes on that spot and I don't get a bite, I can write that spot off and 10 other ones near it. It's like, they're not in the area here. Let's go look at something else. So cover a lot of water. There's a lot of times, uh, you know, you kind of get dialed in and you know what to look for. I won't cast a whole lot in practice uh, if I'm looking for something. You know, with today's electronics, you can drive over and you can pretty much tell what you're looking for. Geez, it was two years ago in the fall. I had my wife with me. There was a, 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 BFL, a BFL Super Tournament. And I, I wasn't catching anything. I'd practiced for two days and I was kind of down and it was going to be beautiful day the day before the tournament she says let's go out on the boat and i said better yet let's go out on the boat and let's go fishing you can lay out in the sun and i'll 
out fishing practice for the tournament. And about the middle of the day, I'm idling around, drove over a spot where it was a spot that's, I fished it 15 years ago. I haven't, haven't fished there a lot. I told her, I said, honey, there they are. I said, watch this. And I spun the boat around and it was, it was every single cast. I, I went back there the day of the tournament. I think day one, I had uh, 26 and a half pounds in, I that took about an hour. And then uh, went back there on day two. <laughs> I, I caught that kind of weight and was actually in second a, after the first day. And I had the same co-angler. We went back there on day two and did virtually the same thing. I think I weighed 50 pounds for two days. So I guess cover a lot of water, but, you know, 90% of the fish are in 10 or 15% of the water. There's You need to be around structure. And you get to the western basin of Lake Erie, you, you can't drive over sand bottom and mud bottom in the middle of nowhere. And just cast out and catch fish. So, you know, your your fishing structure off the Bass Islands, Peely Island, wrecks, deep drops off the channel, uh, reefs way offshore, things like that when you look, obviously. Now this place where you found those fish for the for the BFL, you said you haven't fished there a whole lot and you kind of just stumbled upon it. I'm curious to know, is that produced after the BFL for you on a consistent basis now, or is it kind yeah. of hit and miss? Yeah, it has. I think it was a spot that that I just, I don't know, uh, out of all the time, you know, you, you, you have your spots that you're drawn to. And I, I found that, I don't know, I went back and I looked at the waypoint. It was really old. And and I had fished there a few times and caught a couple fish, but it was never, it never kind of got into the, into the rotation or the lineup for a tournament. But no, I, I've went back there numerous times since then and, and done pretty well. I uh, even guided a few clients a few times back there. And, and uh, it was, it was fantastic. So yeah, it was uh, deeper water, like 27, 28 feet, and it topped out at, I don't know, 24, 23, stuff like that. Just just little stuff, little rocks, little gravel, just little little things that come up uh, where those fish can school up and and uh, chase big shad. That's that's what they eat on, you know, great big shad uh, in, the, in the late summer and fall. They're hacking those things up, gorging. I mean, there's, there was a pile of them. Interesting. So when you're fishing for those fish that are that are feeding on shad over gobies, is does that kind of affect how you fish for them, or are you still using maybe goby? Or I, I don't want to speak for yourself as far as baits and and whatnot, but walk me through that whole scenario as far as I, bait choice. Yeah, I I throw a drop shot probably 75, 80 percent of the time. Um, it, it it used to be a big secret. We wouldn't say much about it, but now it's 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 coming out a whole lot more. I call it I call it big stretch. Uh, the Z two, whether that's the big one, the little one. I do I do still use a lot of gulp. I, I believe in it. I like it. This year that Berkeley um, Max sent the uh, you caught me off guard. What what's what's the flatworm? Flatworm. Yep. And. Uh, that's a good bait, but uh, yeah, I do I do use any when they're like that any minnow style bait, um, and you can you can see the shad on, on on down scan and side scan. You can see those big big balls of them. They they're just you know they'll just cruise around those humps and you know you get on the right patch, you throw it out in in the drop shot. It no sooner hits the bottom or doesn't even make it to the bottom. Take up the slack, you got it. Right. So I'm really curious as far as, you know, Lake Erie, we know has a, a huge population of walleye. You're going to have some drum sheephead in there as well. And of course the smallmouth. can you, have you kind of determined how those fish relate to each other? Do you run across a mixed school ever? Do you run across, do they like each other? Can you talk I, me through that? Yeah. The, 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 the walleye, you, you catch those occasionally. But I don't think the vast majority of the spots when 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 I'm deeper bass fishing, I don't catch a ton of walleye. Um, I think they'll mix with the smallmouth a little bit, um, but but I, I, they've never really bothered me. I don't think they they bother one another or compete for the 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 same spot or habitat, if you will. But sheephead, I, I, I've noticed you you get on a spot out there that's that's just loaded with sheephead. I, I believe they drive the bass off the spot if there's a lot. I'm not saying you don't catch the occasional sheephead, um, but you know if I get to a spot and it's it's five six sheephead in a row, very seldom do I catch a bunch of smallmouth um, on a deal like that. Very seldom. I don't think they coexist very well. 
I agree. I see that a lot when I fish on Lake Ontario. We, we're starting to run into more and more big groups of, of sheephead out there. And it's really, uh, it's frustrating because you'll graph something. And I, I still can't really tell with straight 2D if it's a, a smallmouth or a sheephead. Uh, I'm starting to be able to pick them out a little bit on the live scope, but I have to fish and then maybe not get bites like I would think, and then perhaps take the camera out and, you know, determine, hey, this is a school of sheephead. I can't mess with it. How, how do you differentiate this, you know, yourself from, you know, different species, whether it be a bass or a sheephead? When, when, when I'm fishing and I'm looking at just your basic 2D sonar, I use uh, the, the electronics that I use are the Rants. Um, I got some buddies that got the Garmin Pan Optics, and I, I had a lot of experience with that this past summer. I waited. Um, I, I will probably try the Lowrance, uh live imaging live site, the new technology that they have out. I've not witnessed it. I've not seen it, but that'll be compatible with the units that are on my boat. Um, if it's not, I, I don't have any. You know, I'll get a, a, a pan optics if I have to. Um, I've fished enough with others that have it the, that I really believe in it. Um, and it, it'll, I mean, that unit will pay for itself. But that said, with, with the 2D sonar, I notice the the bass, and I think I use palette. I, I think it's the, the, the color 11, um, I think. The bass have a harder return. A sheep had, it, 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 it seems to me that the mark is, um, I don't know, a little more like it's softer. It's not as loud. And on the palette, the setting that I have where I run my settings, anything that is is a real green, it's got a real hard return. It's real solid. It's real dense. To me, those are bass. Um, and the majority of the bass that I'm dropping on at those depths, they're, they're a couple, three feet up off the bottom. Um, I don't know if they're just up there, you know, looking up, waiting to chase something. Um, but I think they suspend a little bit more. And I've seen the sheep head, the sheep head are a little bit tighter to the bottom, but that's just my opinion. Uh, and then when, when you're actively fishing for them, a sheep head will knock the bait real hard. You know, bass just, you might feel a little tick, but it just kind of turn, turns to mush and there's pressure, especially with the drop shot. Sheep head, you'll just sit there and they'll boom. Dum, dum. I just, I don't even set the hook. I just pull it away from them. So talk a little bit more about the deep, the deep water fishing. It's, uh, it's something I'm, I'm really, uh, it's one of my favorite ways to, to target fish. It's interesting. You said that you'll see them suspend, you know, three, two, three feet off the bottom at times. Are you looking for big groups, big schools of fish, or are you sometimes targeting individual fish as well? I guess that depends on what pattern the fish are in, but generally if I'm fishing deeper, um, I believe that on average, a fish that you catch out of deeper water like that are going to be larger fish. Yeah, I'll, I'll pull up on a spot and and I'll kind of drive around and I kind of get a feel for how many fish are there. Um, if I mark a ton of fish, I'll kind of keep the boat back, spot lock it and cast to them, you know, kind of triangulate, use your point one antenna, put them 20, 30, 40 feet out in front of the boat cast right to them or past them and you know pull your bait into them with the current if there's not a lot of marks there sometimes i'll start out by kind of fan casting over the spot and then uh i'll take the to, uh, the trolling motor off spot lock and i i when i mark that spot on my unit i basically use waypoints to mark the entire shape of the structure so then i'll just cruise around the whole structure and I will watch my sonar, watch my electronics, you know, I'll kind of flip the bait, you know, I'll flip it 20 feet this way. And the whole time I'm staring at my graph. And if I see one, you know, wind in real fast, as fast as I can, boom, drop it straight down. And when they want to bite, which is usually pretty often that they're not very hard to catch like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely exciting way to fish. Can you walk me through your your actual setup? You said you like to drop shot on those fish a lot. Can you talk about the uh, the rod as well as the line? And then let's get into a little bit detail on on the hook size as well as weights and how you kind of rotate through that. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I use uh, a six ten Loomis. Um, they're they're older drop shot rods. They're the green. I don't even know if they make them anymore. 
there's like a dark green blank in, in the rod is specifically uh, a drop shot rod. It's a DSR 822 mag medium. Um, I've got, I think five of them. Mm -hmm. uh, those are by far uh, my favorite drop shot rod. I use a couple others, but um, I pretty much use, use the Loomis uh, exclusively, you know, tournaments and, and I get them all rigged up. I use Shimano uh, Stratic uh, C1, uh, C14 uh, spinning reel. As far as line, I will use both braid and fluoro. I know that's going to sound crazy, but I'll, I'll run braid to an eight pound fluoro leader. And then there are times, uh, I'm still kind of old school with this. I'll run like 10 pound fluoro as my main line. And I'll use a little itty bitty spro swivel. I think it's a size 10, maybe. I, I, it's really small. I'd have to dig it out. Um, and from that, I'll put about a four foot liter of eight pound floral carbon. My reason for doing that is I, I had, and, and maybe this is just in my head, but I had a tournament where I had all my rods rigged up with braid and the fish were just pecking at the bait. And uh, man, I felt like I was pulling it away from a lot of them. Absolutely no stretch. So I kind of went back to my old ways and I'm kind of stubborn uh, with that. The hook that I use is, is a hook that a lot of guys use. Gamagatsu split shot, drop shot, size one uh, with a bigger bait. I will go to same hook, same, same model, uh, Gamagatsu split shot, drop shot, and I'll use a one aught. I use uh, just a standard lead drop shot weight. I don't, I don't use a tungsten one. Reason being, you lose so many weights. They get jammed up into rocks and the gravel and all that stuff down there. But uh, I would say typically I use a half ounce. In the deeper water, if it's dead calm and I'm in that 15 to 20 foot range, I'll use a three eighths. And I would say my standard lead off of off of my my weight would probably be 15 to 18 inches, maybe off the bottom is is where I'll tie the hook. I I do love your recommendation on that that uh, Gamagatsu drop shot split shot hook. It's a hook that I use. Have a lot of confidence in that. You know, that one odd on a bigger base. So you're talking maybe if you're using more of a Gobi style or something with just some thicker plastic. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, but, you know, I use I use uh, like take, for example, Berkeley Gulp three inch uh, minnow, um, uh, Berkeley Max Scent Flatworm, Jackal, Crosstail Shed. Excellent bait. I, I'm, I'm size one all day. The smaller of the two choices on hook on those. That's perfectly fine. But uh, I'll still use an old Poor Boys Gobi some. There's a, a company out of Michigan. They make a, a, a little a little Gobi. Um, it's a little larger. Uh, those fish will. They'll, they'll bite a Gobi bait. And obviously, you know, you clean your live a lot at the end of the day or they'll regurgitate. They hack up a lot of Gobies. That's still still one of the number one food sources, obviously. But with with a bait that's that's a little, little firmer, a little larger, there's a little more to it, I'll go to the one-aught hook you know, a larger hook for a, a bigger bait for sure. I do want to circle back and talk about that fluorocarbon, uh, straight fluoro and then a fluorocarbon leader because it, 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 you bring up a really good point. There's times when, you know, we might get frustrated when we're out fishing, we were missing bites or in your case, you felt like they were biting it, but it was just, you know, with, with braid, there was no give. And perhaps on that given day, it just wasn't working right. So experimenting with uh, a different setup, you might be set in one way like myself, I'm straight braid the floral all the time, but now you got me, now you got me thinking, cause I'm thinking back in my head on some days when I was like, wow, that bites a little weird. Yeah. Yeah, yeah abs absolutely. I mean, there, there's times, obviously when, when, when you're practicing for a tournament or you're fishing a tournament or even just out fishing with buddies, you know, you want to find the, the, the mega school where, you know, I always say you could throw a hot dog out there and they bite it. It doesn't matter. But the but the reality is it's not always like that. They can be finicky. They can be picky. They can just, you know, it's a full moon. They're feeding at night or first thing in the morning and they're not biting very good. Uh, you know, you got, I, I think that you get late June into, into mid-July. That's a transition period. Things are kind of goofy. So you might not be fishing for you know, might not be getting 20, 25, 50 bites a day where you're killing them. You might be getting five to eight bites a day. So I want to make sure that, you know, mentally and, and, and I'm, everything's right in my mind um, and not second guessing things. 
And I just had a couple of tournaments where I felt like it was a tough bite. And uh, I, I knew they were bass that I was marking and they were just picking at the bait. It was real subtle. I, I, that was what I attributed it to. And I may be wrong, but I've never had had any issues in terms of myself feeling feeling the bite, sensitivity, things like that with with straight floral. So, you know, that's something that that I do. Uh, quite often, but usually I have a couple rods rigged up both ways. Um, and most times I don't, I don't know that it makes a difference, but I would say, I would say on those tough days, you know, maybe it does. Um, at least it makes a difference, you know, in my head, I eliminate that variable. So I'm not playing mind games, you know, with myself and thinking back to, to those days where I had a tough time. Right. So you have a lot of good success uh, on the tournament scene. You've, you've got numerous, numerous top tens. You've, you've done some damage out there on Lake Erie. Would you say most of your uh, your wins were because of a, a technique called, you know, using the drop shot? Was was that pretty much what was in your hands? Yeah, I, I, I would say that um, I, I throw a two uh, some there. There's times uh, Steve Clapper is a really good friend of mine. He moved up here, lives just down the road. Uh, from me and we fish together a lot and he's always you know jared you gotta throw that tube you gotta throw that tube and in my head i'm thinking i'm not throwing that goofy tube they're biting this drop shot there's days where i'm not getting bit as much and i pick that tube up uh just isg tube in uh, a color called goby or uh, a smoke purple and um they will bite it and, and and i still catch a lot of fish on it and, and when you get bit on it it's usually a good one so there's been a lot of tournaments where I'll work the spot over pretty good uh, with the drop shot. I got a good bag. You know, you're sitting there and you're going, man, if I had that big one, if I had that big one. And I'll get that big tube out and uh, I'll, I'll kind of fish it slow a few times. And usually I have one rigged up with a heavy head, you know, a five eighths or even a three quarter ounce head. And I'll, I'll cast it way out there and, you know, into the wind off the boat and work it back. And uh, I'll pop it, you know, snap it four or five feet, snap, snap up off the bottom and let it fall back and then move it real slow and snap it again. And so I've caught a lot of big fish uh, in tournaments that way um, in, in, in weighed some some key fish in some bigger tournaments doing that for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, that's an interesting technique. A lot of people think about drag, you know, fishing a tube. You're just kind of dragging off the bottom, but you're, you know, what the, what they call cracking the tube and, and really yes. working that. I'm curious to know, in your mind, when you uh, when you pick up that technique and you're getting bites on it, is it because you're making those fish bite, or they? Is it sometimes you get around some neutral fish, or you know they're there and they're just not really active? Does that trigger a bite, or is it more so a technique when they are biting, you can just load the boat quickly with that, or is it kind of a mixture? I think it's both for sure. You get on the right school. I think you can throw a drop shot. You could throw a little swim bait. Um, that's another way I catch quite a few, especially spring and fall uh, is a little swim bait. But to answer your question, I I will use that that technique in a tournament to try to trigger uh, a batch of fish that for whatever reason, it's a tough bite or I do that a lot when I'm sitting at a spot and I'm throwing out there, you know, and I'm, I'm killing them on the drop shot. And it starts to slow down. It starts to slow down. And I can still see them. They're still there. So then I'll follow up with that technique um, in, in hopes to, to catch a few more. And, and that's a good big fish technique. I've, I've caught a lot of a lot of five plus plus uh, pound smallmouth cracking a tube for sure. Absolutely. Out there, it can get pretty brutal. I'm sure you had your fair share of uh, just days you wish you weren't out there, but you had to be. Uh, what's your ideal conditions for fishing deep? Well, sunny, number one. Absolutely high sun. I, I strictly, uh, firmly believe that smallmouth are sight feeders. Absolutely. They can see better on those days. I will say, give me, you know, five to ten mile an hour wind, just a little chop. Um, but I'm not going to complain if it's dead flat. Um, my reason for that is it allows me to maximize my time in being a local here. I can hit a lot of spots. There's a lot more margin for air when it's calm because I can hit 
15, 20 spots over the course of the day. When on the contrary, if it's four, five, six foot waves and you're moving and you're driving 15, 16, 18 mile an hour to go a long way, I mean, then you got to be dead on them. And they'll bite in that stuff, and I can fish in that stuff, no problem. I mean, you can hold. I mean, I, I can I can hold and fish in five six foot waves, absolutely no problem. Don't like it. There's not a lot of, you know, there's not much fun in it. But they'll bite in that stuff. You, you don't have much time. I mean, you gotta you gotta be amongst them, and and, and you gotta be on your game immediately because you just simply don't have a lot of time. Jared, you make a, you bring up a really good point. That's always uh, something you know. I tell people when you're when you're preparing for a tournament or an event and it's going to blow that day, you better make the right choice on what direction you're going to go because you might, you're not going to be able to go hit all 15, 20 spots. You got to, you got to think, okay, we might have a shot here. And if they're not there, you might be able to head over here. And by that time it's two o'clock in the, uh, in the afternoon or one o'clock and you got to get your butt back to the ramp. Yeah. If, if, if it's a multi-day tournament, I don't want to say I ever lay up, but if it's, if it's really rough like that, typically weights are going to be down across the board. And if I got a spot that's got a bunch of them, three and a half to four pounds, I, I kind of gravitate toward that that way first and make sure that, you know, you get 18, 19 pounds in the live well as opposed to going and looking for the mega bag because, you know, you could die real quick <laughs> doing that. Yes. How how many times have you gone out there and just had a terrible morning and then all of a sudden you just run across them and you and you and you're doing well in the tournament? Does that happen more often than not? Or do you normally have a solid plan and you can fill the boat right away and then kind of explore the rest of the day? Well, I've 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 had it both ways. Um, you know, going back to that that uh, super tournament BFL that I was talking about, uh I'll I'll cite a couple of tournaments there. Um, and there'll be examples of both. Um, I, I knew that that was going to happen. I mean, when I say it was every cast, I mean, it, when I got done practicing with my wife, I, I caught about 15 of them. She dropped down and caught a few. I drove around and I, I found five or six of the little high spots in that area. And Travis, there was, I mean, I'm not talking 15 or 20. There was a hundred of them on every spot. I mean, so it was, it was get healthy in a hurry right away. And after day one, and I had that stringer, I went practicing um, and, and, and I looked around and I found some other fish that, I mean, it, it wouldn't have helped me, but we, we caught quite a few fish after that. Um, so, you know, a lot of times you can get on them right away, fishing deep. You know, there's a lot of times the you catch seven or eight within the first couple hours of the morning, you're not going to help yourself after that because they're all four plus pounds. So you might as well leave and save them and go look. Mm -hmm. But there's also times where, you know, you think, okay, I, I got them dialed in or I'm going to do this. And you go there and it's like, oh, no, they're gone. They're not biting. There's not as many here as I thought. Um, in, in, you know, then it's like, oh, my gosh. And you start running water. Um, and I think it was, uh, I think. I don't know, like 2016, I fished a strand, uh, a ray of that out of Sandusky, and uh, I had a spot really good the first day, and I tried to avoid going there because it was way out of the way, and I thought, if I'm going to win, I'm going to save this hole. Well, I fished all over the first day, and it's like 1130, almost noon, and I told my co-angler, I said, this 15-pound bag, I said, we can't be having this. We got to go to the ace in the hole and he's like okay you know sounds great so we went there and loaded up i mean it was awesome it was great went there the second day caught like 19 and a half 20 pounds i think i was i was tied for first with with dave lefebvre going into the final day went there the third day and the fish were very picked over from myself being there two days prior and i kind of kind of ran out um and i'm running around Peely island I ran over a, a, a spot that that uh, I was just driving, and uh, I, I never marked that spot before in literally thousands of hours out there. It was a little rise. I found a batch of fish the at the back end of the uh, third day there, and it was awesome fishing. Um, and unfortunately, I came up a little short and got second in the tournament. But, um, you know, there, there's times where you nail them right away in the morning and you can go look, and then there's times where, you know, 
you just got to keep moving and just got to keep running your stuff and hope hope that that you run into them and and they are nomadic they'll they'll move i mean you can you can think that you're on them and you can have a big batch of them down there you know two days later you go there and you look at your electronics you're like where'd they go they're not here and that's where you know going back to what we talked about with it being calm if you can keep cycling through so many spots eventually you know i feel that with with quality spots you're going to run into them eventually so that example of that tournament where you found them later in the day did you you know in your mind when you were struggling that morning and it wasn't going your way were you worried or were you like you know what i'm just going to keep trying to see if i can get it going and i always can go did you have that in the back of your mind where you're like i got this i just in a little bit i'm going to head over there and grab my five fish that was a deal where doubt was starting to creep into my mind um and it's like you know you can't win on the first day but you can surely lose um because you can you know you you, you can't weigh in 14 15 pounds on a great lake smallmouth tournament you, it's just it's going to kill you you know you can go catch 22 23 pounds day two and pair it with 14 pounds and you might squeak in the top 10 but that's not even likely you're certainly not going to win so i'm fishing 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 on day one of that tournament and and finally it was just something where you know it, it you're, you're thinking well the heck with this let's go catch him um because i had caught him there or seen him there the day before um and and we certainly did but I, I wasn't catching much before that. So that was a, you know, sometimes they're biting on a lot of spots. You just got to find the right size of fish. Well, that certainly wasn't the case that day because there was a lot of guys not, not catching them very good at that time, but there sure was a giant school of them there. I think that's a really important, uh, you know, what we just talked about, I just want to kind of go over because for a lot of people, what you did that day might seem foreign or not the right move, but that just comes with, you know, having the confidence in your abilities and the body of water that you're fishing. A lot of guys would have said, you know what, I'm in a big tournament. I'm going straight to that spot. And the reason why I think you're so successful is you have, you're able to control the emotions of knowing that you might have some fish over here, but man, if I could catch a, a decent bag and not touch them, you know, I'm just putting the pieces together. I want to speak for yourself, but I think that's, that's kind of your mindset, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when you when you have a multiple day tournament, you're you're very seldom are you going to find one single spot and you're going to fish there for four or five hours both days and 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 win or do exceptionally well off one spot. So I knew that was a good spot. I was trying to get through day one and get 19, 20 pounds. And I thought I could do that based off practice. It just, you know, a lot of times we think we can do things and it turns out mm -hmm. we can't. Um, but I was trying to save that spot as, as kind of the home run. And if, if, if I would have been able to do that, I couldn't, but if I would have, um, and I would have had enough in other places, um, or potentially found the spot that I found late on the third day, before I would have won, but you know, that's the way it goes and that's a chance you take. But you know, another thing that I will say is when I first started doing this, I would always be like, oh, well, you know, look who's in the tournament. There's this guy and there's this guy and there's this guy and I got to do this. And the longer I fished and the more I experienced things, I don't think about that anymore. I don't really care who's in the tournament because as much time as you spend out there, you know what big smallmouth are. I don't look at it as if I'm fishing against another 100 or 150 anglers. I'm fishing against the fish. I'm fishing for four pound, four pound plus smallmouth. That's 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 my job. That's what I got to catch. Um, and if you do that, you're going to ultimately be successful no matter who or how many guys are in the tournament. It, it doesn't matter. I mean, that's what it takes to do well here. And that's what you need to look for. So, you know, the more spots you can find with those fish uh, in string together quality days, certainly the better off, better off you are. A lot of good lessons for anybody that fishes tournaments, especially smallmouth tournaments on these types of bodies of water. That was great. Now, I, I do also want to, the last day was a key thing, what you said. You were running on, on pad and you found a rise. I don't think people utilize their 2D enough when you're running around the lake, you, you know, besides just having your map up, a 2D graph of what's going on below your boat, even at a 30, 40, 50 mile an hour speed, if you can, 
uh, you can learn a lot if you watch that. Would you agree? Absolutely. Always have your 2D on at your council when you're driving. Uh, I have I have two Lowrance HDS 12s um, and, and I have one set up for map mapping. Um, and then I have the other one, uh, 2D side scan. Um, and, and, and that's the way. And then I'll, I'll use down scan some when I'm hunting and pecking and moving around. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I can't tell you how many spots I've found that way. If I'm in a new area and I'm driving contours or I'm, I'm looking, I'm not idling. I'm, I'm up on plane and I'm driving around and I'm looking for irregularities in the bottom. And then if it's like something that catches my eye and I'm like, ooh, then I slow down, then I side scan, then I down scan, then I'm really, you know, I'm kind of more in like, hey, you know, I'm perked up, like we need to look at this. But until I see something while moving, if I'm looking for a new spot, um, absolutely not. And you'll be surprised. You'll have an area. It's like, okay, well, you know, I'm catching them around North Bass and I got three spots here. You'll pop your boat up on pad to run to the next spot. And no matter how much time you spent there idling, you think you've seen it all, that graph will jump up on 2D and you'll go, hmm. And then you slow down and you investigate and there's a lot more to it than what you ever thought, especially when the fish are there. They'll show you, they'll show you the type of areas they want to be on. All you got to do is pay attention. Well, this is fascinating. You, your track record speaks for itself. I do want to get through a few other questions here uh, before we end this. Uh, it, it always fascinates me. I, I ask this question to a lot of our guests and I'd like to know your answer to this one. If you could use one bait for the rest of the year, uh, what would it be to catch smallmouth? You're only allowed one bait. Man. Uh, one bait all year long, spring, fall. Yep, that's it. Ooh, that's tough because I there's uh, – I'll say a drop shot just because – it's by far, in my opinion, my best bait in the summer, and I do catch them on it spring and late fall, so I could catch them all year long. Drop shot, uh, um, and I'll say a Berkeley Gulp three-inch minnow on a drop shot. That would be my favorite. Okay. What color? We've got to go there. Smell. Smell. Can't go wrong with that. Yep. What's your biggest uh, smallmouth, personal best? Seven nine. Ooh, I've caught uh, I've caught one seven nine, and I caught a six fifteen. I waited five times, hoping it would just go to seven pounds. But uh, I caught it the day before a tournament. I was practicing, and I had one spot, and um, my wife was with me. And I said, "I'm gonna go back there and check that spot." Which let that be a tournament lesson. That's the dumbest thing to do because mm -hmm. if you know you're going there, this is before you know you learn, you get older, you get wiser. Um, before, uh, the tournament, I knew I was going to fish there. So why go back there? You, you go back there, you don't catch them. You're going to be disappointed. It's going to mess with your mind. You go there and do catch them. You're going to stick big ones and you're going to go, Oh, well, I knew I was coming here. That was stupid, but it got the best of me. I was having a tough day. So I go drop 32 feet fishing, uh, down East off of Vermillion and, uh, drop down. There's a group of them and set the hook and that thing jumped it looked like a giant carp coming out of the water i told my wife i said geez oh pete's honey get the net and it got in the net and i was just like oh my gosh and i weighed it and i thought i might keep that and get that mounted and then i'm like no i can't kill that fish and took four or five really nice pictures of it and let her go and watched her swim away awesome what'd you catch him on drop shot berkeley golf three inch minnow there you go why wouldn't you yep. throw that year round if it's catching, right. uh, you know, seven, seven, seven and a half pounders? Yeah. Wow. This was fascinating. I, there's so much more we can get into. I, I just want to thank you for coming on the, uh, the show. And it's been uh, a pleasure learning all about your, uh, you know, how you, how you go about fishing Erie. If you could you know, leave us with this, if you could give some advice to somebody that's new, uh, coming up to Lake Erie or any of the Great Lakes, really, and trying to get on some fish. They they may not have a lot of experience, but they have the right setup. You know, they got the right boat. They got the right drafts. Where do they, where should they start? Uh, the Bass Islands uh, are great places. Any island. I, when I say the Bass Islands, I'm talking South Bass, Middle Bass, North Bass, Kelly's. Uh, islands in the western basin of Lake Erie, and there's uh, 18 or 20 of them. Um, you know, and you want to look anywhere from, there's a lot of fish that can be caught shallow, eight, 10, 12 feet of water, especially 
spring into the into the early part of the summer. Um, but you know, most fishermen anymore are pretty adept at using their electronics. Um, they're fairly whether they do a lot of scan or they, they can use 2D sonar. You know, you want to look, you want to look for rocky areas, um, you know, little transitions. Take, for example, I'm driving along, you know, it's it's 20, 21 feet, 20, 21 feet. And here it starts coming up and it comes up to 17, 16, and then goes back down. Well, you know, mark that spot, put a waypoint there. I, I always, you know, on, on my Lowrance, I'll just slide my cursor back, double tap, boop, boop, put a waypoint in. And I'll mark up eight or 10 areas like that. Then I'll go back and I'll drive around those areas um, and, and look for fish. Um, but it's it's an we we have an excellent excellent fishery um you know during the tough times you'll think oh you know we got a population problem and things like that we fished this fall i mean we were catching 100 to 150 fish a day it was fantastic you know we're, we're just very blessed to have have uh, such a good fishery but you know going back to your question tubes drop shots um you know but not as much drift and drag as what I see some of the old timers and some people do. Find that spot. Um, even use a marker buoy if you got to, if you're not very good with your electronics. Um, you know, find that spot, mark those fish. Um, and if you work them over with a tube or a drop shot uh, around the islands and things like that, you're, you're certainly bound to, to catch your share of fish. As summer moves on, they go deeper and just keep moving out with them. Um, you know, move out offshore a little further, a little deeper as as summer wears on all right jared awesome stuff i know our our listeners learned a lot uh how can uh how can we follow you get a hold of you if we want and as well as um you know who are some of your sponsors out there uh you can get a hold of me um at uh i'm on facebook uh roadie guide service um r-h-o-d-e roadie guide service and i do tournament updates and in and i'll post some things on there um, in, in, in a lot of the stuff, not only there's smallmouth, there's walleye stuff on there as well. Um, and, uh, feel free to, to send me, you know, if people are watching this and you guys got questions or anything, I'll entertain those. Uh, I love to talk fishing, love to help people out. Um, very approachable when it comes to things like that. Uh, so any way I can help, you know, shoot me a note and, uh, I'll be happy to help you. Um, in, in terms of sponsors, uh, you know, Vic Sports Center is a, is a local dealer here in uh, Northeast Ohio, Kent, Ohio. Very, very uh, gr excellent Ranger dealer. Um, and I get my boats through them. Uh, so, you know, Ranger boats. Uh, I do run, we didn't get to this in the show. I run a 620 uh, boat. They sell a lot of walleye boats here, which are excellent for big water on the Great Lakes. And they're very knowledgeable when it comes to setup and things like that. Uh, so Vix and Ranger. Um, and then Crown Battery as well. Uh, Crown Battery is a local company. Uh, out of Fremont, Ohio, um, you know, but they're, they're global. They sell batteries all over, uh, all over. And uh, they're excellent batteries. I've had no issues uh, with those at all. Um, so those companies helped me out a little bit. I'm very thankful uh, for that. Really good stuff, Jared. I appreciate you hanging out with us. I wish we could keep talking, but uh, we got, I, I'm ready to get back at it, man. You're, uh, you're, you're talking drop shot. You're talking my style. Uh, for this episode i hope a lot of, a lot of our listeners uh picked up a, a man you you laid it out there if you're really looking at getting into you know competitive fishing and and successful you know even at the the low the smaller level at the bfl levels and things like that um all the way up to the opens you know some of these tips that you talked about you guys got to really pay attention sometimes it's that small detail that separates yourself from from the other anglers out there and i certainly appreciate you uh you coming on jared absolutely no problem it's been a pleasure um and uh you know i appreciate this it's pretty cool i've watched some of the other shows so uh keep uh keep right on advocating for those brown bass i love we'll it. do we'll do all right guys until next time we'll see you on the water thanks so much for listening today make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on instagram at smallmouth crush also the youtube channel smallmouth crush and if you feel so inclined please leave us a five-star rating and comment with a review below and as always until next time we'll see you on the water